Hello, welcome to the McGoffin Home in El Paso, Texas. For the next 50 minutes, you will hear the story of the McGoffins and the history of this home, which was built in 1875. You will see the home as it looked from 1930 until 2005. After those segments hosted by Suzanne Michaels, I will return with an extensive update on the renovations that have taken place in the home. That work, which cost $125,000, transformed the home back to the way it looked and functioned in 1898 when Joseph and Octavia McGoffin lived here. The McGoffin home is now operated by the Texas Historical Commission. We want to thank the underwriters who made this program possible. The El Paso County Historical Society, the El Paso Electric Company, the McGoffin Compañeros, the El Paso County Historical Commission, and Capstone Productions, Inc. This program is made possible in part by a grant from Humanities Texas, the state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And now, El Paso's McGoffin Home. This is El Paso's McGoffin Home, where two countries meet and two cultures combine. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. Don Tito, Señor Ariola. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. El Paso in the 1890s. This dignified adobe hacienda is the region's social center. A who's who of Texas and Mexico gather for parties and politics at the home of Joseph and Octavia McGoffin. A few years earlier, El Paso was a sleepy frontier settlement, but all that changed when the first of five railroads arrived in 1881, bringing more people, better products, and a new level of sophistication to the booming border city. By the 1890s, El Paso was a center of trade and commerce for the Great Southwest, and no family was more prominent than the McGoffins. They entertain several times a month, always in grand Victorian style. Their guests were influential people from throughout the region, greeted by the McGoffins in the home's great hall. Judge, so good to see you. Mrs. Bassett, it is indeed my honor. Mrs. Bassett, so good of you to come. My daughter, Josefina. Buenas tardes, senor. Tonight's guests will be part of a special family celebration at El Paso's McGoffin home. Today, the McGoffin Home is a Texas State Historic Site operated by Texas Parks and Wildlife. Visitors come to see the unusual territorial style architecture of the home, as well as learn about one of El Paso's founding families. Joseph and Octavia McGoffin built this home. Then for the next century, their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren lived here. This old adobe house was modernized as times changed, but one constant remained. Generations of McGoffins who mixed their Mexican ancestry with Irish roots to form a uniquely American family. Tonight, the family is celebrating daughter Josephine's engagement. Ladies and gentlemen, Octavia and I want to thank you, our good friends from El Paso, and El Paso del Norte for coming here to help us celebrate the impending wedding of our daughter, Josephine. Thank you. Here, 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 here. When Octavia and Joseph McGoffin threw a dinner party, politics was as likely to be on the menu as lamb. That's what a group of El Paso reenactors feast on as they show how the McGoffins set the social standard. Dinner is served in the Great Hall of the McGoffin Home, a space that has served as a ballroom, office, and parlor over the years. Mm -hmm. 
Staffers at the McGoffin home worked for days to prepare the Great Hall. It is the only room in the home that can hold the family's original walnut dining table. With all 10 leaves in place, the table comfortably seats 20 for dinner. <laughs> Caterers base the feast on an 1896 menu served at the McGoffin home. True to Victorian style, the eight course meal takes hours to eat. It begins with an appetizer of fancy hors d'oeuvres. The second course is a light green salad. Followed by a rich seafood bisque. Then whitefish garnished with fruit. Next comes a cool sorbet to cleanse the diner's palate. The sixth course is meat, of course. Roast lamb served with potatoes and fresh green beans. Then the diners are served the first of two dessert courses. The luscious creme brulee is a big hit with tonight's guests. And the feast finale is a selection of fragrant cheeses. It's getting late when the McGoffins and their guests gather in the formal parlor. Daughter Josephine provides the evening's entertainment, playing the grand piano brought all the way by train from Baltimore. Then, according to Victorian custom, Octavia and the ladies retire to the family parlor. Joseph and the gentlemen enjoy cigars and port as another grand evening at Casa McGoffin comes to an end. The history of the McGoffin started centuries earlier in Ireland and Mexico. The McGoffins left Ireland in the 1700s and settled in Kentucky. Young James Wiley McGoffin went to Mexico and became a successful merchant on the Santa Fe to Chihuahua Trail. In the 1830s, he married the daughter of a prominent Mexican family, Maria Gertrudis de los Santos Valdez de Veramendi. James and Maria settled in Chihuahua, Mexico, where all seven of their children were born, and all seven spoke Spanish before they spoke English. In 1850, James established McGoffinsville in what became El Paso. He made his fortune trading and farming, selling supplies to settlers, travelers, and nearby Fort Bliss. James Wiley McGoffin became one of the region's most prominent citizens. Then, in the 1860s, the country was torn apart by war. During the Civil War, Texas and the McGoffins supported the Confederacy. When Confederate troops took El Paso and nearby Fort Bliss, James Wiley McGoffin's two sons became Confederate officers. When Union troops retook El Paso, many of the families who had supported the South lost their land, including the McGoffins. 
After the war, Joseph McGoffin returned to El Paso and over several years reclaimed much of the family's property. With him came his wife, Octavia McReel, the daughter of a prominent Texas family and their young son, James Wiley McGoffin II. The McGoffins began to build a new home and a new life. The McGoffins were El Paso pioneers, no doubt about it. James Wiley McGoffin started one of the first homesteads on the north bank of the Rio Grande, and he called it McGoffinsville. In fact, McGoffinsville was the first location of what is now Fort Bliss. And it was built there because James Wiley McGoffin rented Fort Bliss the land and the buildings and sold the military most of their supplies. Later, his son Joseph helped bring in the railroads by selling them land and supplies. And then Joseph played an important role in keeping Fort Bliss in El Paso when the post threatened to leave. Both James Wiley McGoffin and his son Joseph saw the region's potential and focused on building McGoffinsville. Their settlement, plus other settlements here along the Rio Grande, later became El Paso, Texas. If James Wiley McGoffin was known as the father of El Paso, then certainly his son Joseph deserved the title Mr. El Paso. Joseph McGoffin was instrumental in getting the city incorporated in 1873. He was a justice of the peace and county judge and served as mayor four times. He helped form the first bank. He was the president and owner of the first streetcar company. He helped establish the first water company, gas company, electric company, sewer system, fire department, public school, and hospital. Joseph McGoffin played a crucial role in helping lead El Paso from a raw frontier town to a bustling city by 1900. The McGoffins were civic and political leaders from the moment they arrived on the north bank of the Rio Grande. El Paso might not have grown into a modern city as soon as it did without the McGoffins and people like them. The McGoffin home that visitors see today is a rambling 20-room hacienda just blocks east of downtown El Paso. When Joseph and Octavia built this home, it was out in the country on 200 acres of land. The little house had three rooms and was made of adobe. In 1875, the McGoffins outgrew the little adobe, so work began on a grand north wing of seven rooms with 14-foot ceilings. Later, the north and south wings were connected, creating the home that generations of McGoffins would occupy for the next century. When the north wing was built in 1875, adobe was still the building material of choice. This time, it was plastered over and scored for a more sophisticated look. But that special treatment was applied only to the walls that visitors would see. When uh, Joseph McGoffin came to El Paso for the first time, there of course were no railroads and the building materials were very hard to come by. So when he built this home, he had to do it in the vernacular, which meant an adobe home with a flat roof. But he added little touches to it that you can see in this house. Uh, Anglo-American touches, which include the scoring, on the, on the wall to make it look like it was made out of stone. George Washington did the same thing at Mount Vernon. And uh, there are some old classical, neoclassical detailing in the windows and the doors that initiated a style which we call territorial. And that makes this building very unique. This has got to be one of the first territorial homes in the entire country, if not in the Southwest. Territorial architecture is all about contrast. The walls' clean lines contrast with the heavy decoration around the doors and windows. We see molded lintels with pediments and pilastered side trim, all done in classic Greek Revival style. Territorial architecture was popular in the Southwest until the 1880s when the railroads arrived. Suddenly, adobe was no good anymore. Nobody wanted an adobe building. They wanted a house a building just like they had back home in the Midwest and in the East. With the railroads, they could import that material. They could bring in the lumber, they could bring in the brick, they could bring in all of the accessories, and they could bring in the contractors and the craftsmen who knew how to build these homes. 
The McGoffin home is one of the few adobe buildings still left in the city. And we are very fortunate to have it and to have it preserved as a state park and as a local landmark. The McGoffin home is one of the last examples of territorial architecture still standing in Texas. It's also a cultural landmark. The McGoffin home is important in Texas history. It's a great example of the mixing of two cultures, Mexican and Anglo. Just look how the family lived day to day. They spoke Spanish at home and in business with their Mexican clients. They also spoke English in business and social settings. They built their home in a traditional style of a Mexican hacienda, then filled it with American furniture decorated with Mexican symbols. The McGoffin home was declared a Texas State Historic Site because it represents the cultural heritage of Texas. Hi folks, come on in. Visitors to the McGoffin home are welcomed into the Great Hall just as guests were a hundred years ago. Welcome to the McGoffin home. My name's Mary Kay and I'm going to give you a guided tour of the home. We're going to start in the formal parlor, which is right over here. So if you'll step this way. The McGoffin home is the only historic house museum in El Paso. This room was used for formal entertaining. Uh, that's why it's called the formal parlor and we have portraits of all the McGoffins in the room. We have a portrait of Joseph McGoffin and his wife Octavia, the home builders. They flanked the fireplace. Uh, over the piano is a portrait of James Wiley McGoffin that was done by Henry Cheever Pratt, who is an artist with the U.S. Boundary Commission. And that portrait was done in 1852 when the Boundary Commission was staying at McGoffinsville at James Wiley McGoffin's home. Furnishings in here are primarily Eastlake style. The parlor set uh, was ordered by catalog and then shipped out to the McGoffins. The center back piece on the chairs features a Mexican eagle and uh, a horseshoe. And we feel like that part of the chair was customized for Joseph McGoffin and that work was probably done in Juarez. So you, you wouldn't expect to find Mexican eagles in a horseshoe on furniture ordered from Boston via catalog. So they had the, the ability to have their pieces customized. Piano was shipped by one of the first freight trains to reach El Paso in 1881. It is a square grand piano made by William Canabi Company shipped from Baltimore. It is uh, in good shape, we keep it tuned, we use it during special events, and one of our volunteer positions is pianist. Uh, to keep the piano in good shape, it needs to be played regularly. So we're, we're always looking for someone that will come in and play about an hour once a week. Uh, and, and if you're interested, please give us a call. Um, it, it's a delightful sound. There's a photograph uh, in this room of this room in 1887. And looking at it and the room, you can see that not much has changed. We have the original furnishings. The mirror over the fireplace is the same mirror. The chairs are all here. On the fireplace, on the mantel, there is a puffer fish. And if you look closely back at the historic photo, that puffer fish was hanging from the light fixture in the center of the room. We are very, very fortunate to have a series of interior photographs all taken in 1887, uh, which is, is a rare and wonderful resource. And that's our basic beginning point when we start uh, moving the furniture and setting up a room as we're matching it to the photos we have of the room, even down to what books we'll put on the table uh, and move around. So we treasure those photographs and have several of them on display in the home. The difference between the 1887 photograph and the room today are primarily due to daughter Josephine. She remodeled in 1930 and removed all her mother's Victorian touches, like all the wallpaper and the carpets and the canvas ceiling. And she finished it in an Art Deco style, which was a very modern style at the time. Uh, so we ended up with the white plaster and the exposed wood floor and the exposed beams. She also completely rewires the house at that time. There was some limited electricity in the home, 
uh, but she completely wires the home and all the light fixtures you'll see on the tour are from 1931. Daughter Josephine McGoffin was the belle of El Paso society. When she married a young lieutenant named William Jefferson Glasgow in 1896, the wedding was the social event of the decade. Her parents hosted an elaborate reception at their home, where this photo of the wedding party was taken. There's the bride and groom, with Joseph and Octavia nearby. Josephine's older brother Jim stands to the side. One hundred years later, in 1996, members of the family gathered at the home to reenact the wedding in period dress. Today, McGoffins are scattered across the country and across the globe. Many of them returned to the homestead for a family reunion in the fall of 2002. At this reunion, I'm fourth generation, and all the fourth generation is here this evening. One, two, three. Very good. The fifth generation, I believe, all will be here. There you go. And then all but two of the sixth generation are going to be here tonight. And so we, we have three generations of live MacGuffins here, along with the, you know, the history and the inanimate objects. I enjoy coming down here very much, and I have to say that it is gorgeous. It has never looked as good. I grew up in the homestead. I came here when I was three years old, and uh, then every uh, vacation that I had, I always came back here because my aunt Octavia McGoffin Glasgow uh, well, she was like a mother to us. <laughs> Family portraits and pictures throughout the home show how times have changed and how the McGoffins have changed. In the Great Hall, I want to point out the portrait of the general, William Jefferson Glasgow. Josephine's husband, was a lieutenant when they married. He was a graduate of West Point and career military. Josephine and the general had five children and we have portraits of four of the five children in the room today. This one is Harriet. Uh, she posed for her portrait to be painted in Paris. Uh, 1927 flapper dress. Uh, the other three portraits in this room include Octavia McGoffin, Glasgow. The middle name is her mother's maiden name. So it's Octavia McGoffin Glasgow in the pale blue dress. She was the last family member to live in the house. Beside her is Edward Glasgow, one of her brothers. And across from Edward is Joseph McGoffin Glasgow, the oldest child. And he, like his father, was a graduate of West Point. The staff at the McGoffin home is always researching and learning more about the house. Their goal is to someday restore parts of the home, about six rooms, to the 1890s period. Well, we know the fireplace was remodeled extensively by daughter Josephine in 1930, and we wanted to know what it was like before she changed it. And the only way to know for sure is to start taking it apart. So we took the plaster off the top and the right side, uh, and found red brick beneath the plaster, and that red brick was not available in El Paso in 1875 when this room was built. We numbered all the bricks before they were removed so that every brick can go back to its original location if we decide to restore it. Um, then we took the bricks out, and behind the bricks we start finding wallpaper. Uh, and there are three layers of wallpaper behind the bricks. The short story is Josephine added the entire future. There was not a fireplace in this room until 1931 when she remodeled. She made the Great Hall her living room and, and wanted the warmth of a fireplace in her living room, so she added the whole feature. One important element of the McGoffin home that has never changed is its adobe construction. Beneath this plaster exterior are hand-formed adobe bricks made from clay mixed with water and straw and dried in the sun. The walls of the McGoffin home are at least two feet thick. All day long, the sun shines on the outside walls and heat begins to move through the walls. Twelve hours later, the first warmth is penetrating the rooms inside. By then, it's cool outside and the sun has set. By morning, the cooler night temperatures have moved through the adobe, so as the sun comes up and the temperatures outside start to rise, 
cooler temperatures are penetrating the walls, keeping the home cool. If you put your hand on an inside wall, even during the hottest part of the day, it's going to feel quite cool. That's Adobe's insulating factor at work. The exterior of the home is plastered to protect the adobe. It's a lime-based plaster, not a stucco or cement, put on about two or three inches thick. A few years ago, I believe it was 1999, we removed all the exterior plaster, the entire home, down to the original adobe and replastered it. And it was a field day for historic archaeologists. We could read the ages of the walls because they were exposed to us. That's an exterior plaster. Ah. Confirming that that was first. And then this room's added later, and it's just butted up against the earlier wall. The highlight stuff you can see is probably some of the rock wedges that are worked into the, to the mortar, uh, to the joints of the adobe, and that's what the plaster bonds to. That's how the plaster hangs onto the wall. So we learned a great deal about the house at that time and, and just had so much fun. It was a mess, but we had a lot of fun. Of course, our primary purpose is to preserve this site for present and future generations of Texans. Uh, and preserving it means knowing every detail you can about the house and maintaining it. So the plaster project allowed us both to look at the original adobe, learn more about the house, uh, as well as preserve it with, with a fresh layer of, of plaster that will help maintain the home for the next 25 years without any deterioration of this 100-year-old adobe. The preservation efforts we're taking right now and steps we're taking right now, it assures us that, that the plaster mix we're using is the right one, that it will endure, and it is protecting the original adobe. And that's, that's the key part for us, is to protect the original core structure. Uh, we, can, we can redo plaster every few years, but we don't want to have to rebuild adobe. Another kind of research is going on below ground at the McGoffin home. Technicians are about to use ground-penetrating radar to search for pieces of the past. Here's McGoffin Avenue. So that would put the well and everything behind the front entrance. We're going to be checking behind the house or south of the house uh, for different features. On this map, we have T1, 2, 3, and 4. Those are known trash pits from the late 1800s. Trash pits and privies often hold valuable clues to life in the past, but sometimes they're hard to locate. Ground-penetrating radar can help do that. It sends a pulse into the ground that bounces back. Reading that signal can reveal disturbances or changes in the soil. Here's that pipe, that second pipe. The ground-penetrating radar was able to find an original trash pit right outside the kitchen door of the McGoffin home. Right about here, you see that. Oh, if, you I stand see a little, if you stand back a little further, you start to see that pit. It doesn't look like it's a very deep pit. No, it would have been um, real shallow. It looks like it maybe goes down to about two feet, and, and, and that's it. Today we use ground-penetrating radar uh, to, to survey the uh, McGoffin home site. Uh, about four or five different areas on the, uh, on the uh, property and the most interesting area was in the southeast corner of the lot where we found what could be uh, the remnants of, a, of another room that was uh, on the end of the house. We have not yet located the outhouses but we're optimistic about finding them because outhouses are known as archaeological treasure troves. Uh, you know from an outhouse, you know what china pattern the family used, because uh, if a maid breaks a piece and doesn't want to tell anyone, you always toss it in that outhouse because nobody will find it. Um, you find perfume bottles and medicine bottles. You learn a great deal about the family from an outhouse, so we're still looking for that. In the family parlor, visitors see more original McGoffin furnishings and learn about a family connection to Abraham Lincoln. This would be the family parlor or back parlor. This would be more like a den in today's home. Family would spend a great deal of time here. The dining table in the room shouldn't be in here. It's in the wrong room. The dining room is across the hall from this room, and the dining table would have been in that room. 
We don't have it there because we rent parts of the building for weddings and receptions and special events, and that room is one of the rooms nobody gets to use the original table. So the table's in the family parlor for safekeeping. A fireplace with family photos on the fireplace. The copper plate on the front face of the fireplace uh, shows up in an 1880s photograph of this room. Uh, apparently this chimney never drew correctly uh, and, and to solve it and get the smoke to go up the chimney like it's supposed to, uh, they added this copper plate and it seems to have worked. They kept using the fireplace for many, many, many more years. Other items in this room, we have another portrait of Joseph McGoffin and his wife Octavia. Another interesting portrait in this room is the portrait of Beriah McGoffin. Uh, he was a contemporary of Abraham Lincoln. We see a lot of resemblance in clothing and style. Um, Beriah would be Joseph's uncle, James' brother, uh, and he was governor of Kentucky at the beginning of the Civil War. There's some really interesting correspondence between Beriah McGoffin and President Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln wanting to know what Kentucky was going to do during the Civil War. Was it going to stay loyal and stay in the Union, or was it going to secede? Uh, they stayed in the Union and Beriah resigned. Uh, but he was very close with Joseph's father, James. Uh, Beriah was close family. Uh, another interesting portrait in this room is the portrait of William Jefferson Glasgow, Jr., named for his father. Uh, and he, like his brother, Joe, uh, and like his father, was a West Point graduate, so we have three West Pointers in this immediate family. Uh, the lights on the wall, the shade, has the silhouette of the West Point cadet to commemorate that military tradition in the family. Furnishings in this room, for the most part, reflect more of Josephine's time period than Joseph's time period. Most of the furnishings in this room are from the 1930s when Josephine remodels. It's a little more comfortable, uh, not quite as formal, uh, as befitting a family party. From the family parlor, there's a worn step that leads into Josephine's bedroom and something that might seem out of place, a chrome handrail. Josephine suffered from arthritis in her later years and that rail was installed to help her step up into the room. So the chrome handrail has become an historic feature of the home. This is Josephine's bedroom. I want you to notice the furniture in here, particularly the bed. The five-piece bedroom set was purchased at the 1884 World's Fair in New Orleans. It was an award-winning design that year. The set includes a wardrobe and a half canopy bed that stands 11 feet tall still with the original tufting and upholstery on the top. There's a marble top table and a marble top dresser and a marble topped washstand. Visitors sometimes notice that most of the pieces are on casters, porcelain casters. They are more than 120 years old, but they still roll smoothly today. The McGoffins built this home before the days of indoor plumbing. Back then, they would just wash up in their bedrooms at the washstand. They would pour some water from the pitcher into the bowl, then wash their face and hands, and maybe take a quick sponge bath. When they do add plumbing to the house, 1897, 
they are used to washing up in the bedroom, so they add a lavatory or a sink into the bedroom. So in the corner, that sink was added in 1897, and they tried very hard to match the marble splashboard with the marble in the New Orleans furniture. Just off Josephine's room are the children's rooms, originally built for guests. That's why there's a private entrance from the patio. Joseph McGoffin extended the hospitality of the home to such men as Charles Moorhead and O.T. Bassett, who became some, some of our founding fathers and leading citizens of El Paso. And they stayed in this room until their own homes were built. When Joseph and Octavia's first grandchild was born in 1897, the rooms became the nursery. New doorways were cut through the adobe walls connecting the rooms to the rest of the house. And here's a little history lesson about closets. They were practically unheard of in private homes before 1900. People put their clothes in wardrobes or trunks or just a peg on the wall. The McGoffin home has three closets like this one, making the house even more remarkable. Over the fireplace, there's a portrait of Bill Lucker, who was raised in this house. He is Josephine's grandson and Joseph's great-grandson. For the reenactment of a McGoffin dinner party, Bill Lucker put on a beard and portrayed his own great-grandfather. Some of the McGoffin's military memorabilia is on display in this room, General Glasgow's room. On the bed we see his military dress whites dated 1891 from West Point. A trunk holds a doughboy uniform from World War I and blue wool pants from the Indian Wars. The general's boots are nearby. The ceiling gives us some clues about when this section of the home was built. Notice the narrow wood planks. That's cut lumber from a lumber yard, and that means this part of the house was built after the railroads had arrived in El Paso. And even though the ceiling planks are narrow, the floorboards in this room are wide. This is the only room in the house with 12-inch floor planks. It may also be the reason this floor is the squeakiest in the house. The oldest part of the McGoffin home, the three-room adobe built about 1870, is now a gift shop. Its ceilings are still supported by original cottonwood beams or vigas. The spaces in between are filled with latias or small branches. When the new north wing was built, this room became the kitchen. Later it was used as a carriage house, children's playroom, and servants' quarters. Now gift shop sales help maintain the home. Just outside is the private family courtyard. It holds a tribute to Joseph McGoffin's public service and a connection to the family's Roman Catholic roots. This is the angel Gabriel. Josephine put the statue out here in the 1930s, and he had great big wings. The El Paso winds would catch those wings and blow him over, and she'd put him back, and she got tired of that and finally put him back up without his wings, and he's been here ever since. We still have the wings. They're in our collection. Once the east side of the building was completed, it enclosed a courtyard that's used today for a variety of special events. There are a lot of points of interest in the courtyard. Among them is the cornerstone from the city hall built in 1899. Cornerstones are traditionally placed in buildings by members of the Masonic Lodge. We know that Joseph McGoffin was an active Freemason, as were many of El Paso's founding fathers. Here's something else visitors find out about the McGoffin home. It seems to be inhabited by friendly spirits. The park superintendent explains. The general consensus is we have three spirits uh, in and around the house. One man, two women. Uh, the man um, has been dubbed Uncle Charlie, who would be Joseph McGoffin's brother-in-law. 
uh, who lived in the home on several different occasions for years at a time. Uh, and, and apparently Uncle Charlie was just happy enough living here that he decided not to ever, ever leave. Uh, he does attend, Uncle Charlie seems to attend almost all the parties and, and special events we have. Uh, he was a real sociable character and apparently remains so today. But you never see Uncle Charlie, you just see what Uncle Charlie does. He'll turn lights on, uh, he's turned some off, but he prefers to turn them on. He sets off the security alarm f regularly, I mean not just once every now and then, I mean every four to six weeks he sets off the security alarm. His rocking chair, we have four documented stories now of his rocking chair rocking all by itself, nobody's near it. Uh, that kind of thing with Uncle Charlie. I have gone through the home with eight psychics, clairvoyants, mediums, and each one we go through the home and they tell their stories then later we come back again and we communicate to the people who they say they see in the home. We were here one night and Julie Evans, a medium, saw a little girl in the window. And she said the little girl was blonde and she was looking out like she was looking for something. Because she said the little girl was eight years old, she was hurting, she was sick, she was sent here because of the weather of El Paso, and she said her name was Rose White. I asked her, well, why was she looking out? She said, because someone promised her a necklace and they never gave it to her. So they always put roses in the window for her. As you can see, we have a necklace there and we have a rose. And that's for the little girl, Rose. Then we had a clairvoyant named Pat from Alamogordo. I came in and I asked her if she would look at that picture of Octavia. And she says, well, she's a very dignified woman. Well, you know, we can buy that. But she says she's wearing a blue dress with a white apron. Now, the lady in blue has been seen as a person many times in this home for many years. When Tia lived here, she had a friend out in the hallway. And the friend said, look, there's a lady in blue. Our head superintendent was in our office back in the back. The lady in blue walked right up to the door and looked in. She said it is great grandmother Octavia. So we have many stories about the lady in blue. The lady in blue, we think that's probably Octavia McGoffin, Mrs. McGoffin, uh, Joseph's wife. Uh, she's seen walking around the grounds. Um, there are 23 different police reports that have been filed by our neighbors, sightings of a lady dressed in blue walking around the grounds. Julie and I, the psychic, came into this room and she said that Josephine was sitting here in the bed with her dress all spread out and she's about eight years old. And she told us that she is hidden something in this bed. And when we find it, we will know it's her because she has signed it. So Julie started looking for the items and about halfway, she said the girl's laughing at us. And I asked why. She said because she's given me hints and I cannot find it. Julie later moved further up towards the head of the bed. She said, this is where the item is hidden. Later, another psyche came in and told me that yes, there's something hidden in the bed, but it's higher, it's higher up the bed. And Dolores came, who was a young girl, and said she knows there's something hidden in this bed and she will find it. As to this date, the item has not been found. The last McGoffin to live in the homestead was Octavia McGoffin Glasgow, called Tia by her family. Tia means aunt in Spanish. She was the oldest daughter of Josephine and the General and the granddaughter of the home's builder, Joseph McGoffin. Tia was born in the fancy New Orleans bed in Josephine's room. She never married, but lived in the home most of her life, helping to raise her sister's three children. By 1976, more than a century after the home was built, Tia was 76 years old and finding it hard to maintain the property. It might have been demolished if it were not for what she did next. Tia offered to sell the home to the city of El Paso and the state of Texas. The idea was greeted warmly by Don Henderson, then mayor of El Paso. We talked and said, what a great opportunity this would be to have a home that is the history of El Paso. 
How many communities in America have a place like that, a home that you can go see that was there at the beginning as a, as a city? Octavia played a key role in saving this piece of El Paso's history and convinced her two brothers it was time to sell the 100-year-old homestead. One condition of the sale was that Tia could live out her life in the home, and she did. She died here in 1986. One hundred years ago, the McGoffin home was El Paso's social center. Everyone is welcome at the old adobe hacienda, now a Texas State Historic Site. The annual spring tea attracts visitors in period dress. What better way to spend a delightful spring afternoon than taking tea on the grounds of the McGoffin home? During the holiday season, the home is elaborately decorated in Victorian style. Old Saint Nick always makes an appearance, and there's a Christmas tree in every room. For some local residents, Christmas tea at the McGoffin home is becoming a new family tradition. Spanish can still be heard at the McGoffin home. Y aquí estamos en el recibidor. Uh, aquí se recibía toda persona que tocaba la puerta en esos días. Some guided tours are given in Spanish. El estado quitó eso para ver si era parte de la casa original y hallaron que en... Each year, hundreds of school children check out the local history and this entire area was Mexico. For the gardener, there's a lot to learn in the Texas Wildscape Garden on the grounds of the McGoffin home, like how to conserve water by using beautiful native plants. We have recently installed a special type of xeriscape garden called a Texas Wildscape because we're using predominantly native plants to this particular ecoregion in West Texas. This is that salt bush over here. This is another dioecious plant, so you want a male and a female, okay? That's really important. Texas Wildscape is different from other low water use type of gardens because of the way that we have arranged the plants. The plant design is to be very attractive to humans as well as beneficial to the very desirable types of urban wildlife that we want to attract into our cities. We have arranged many different layers of vegetation from very low ground covers to native grasses and desert shrubs and larger shrubs and, and desert trees here. So at the McGoffin home, you can come see the way to design one of these Texas wildscape gardens. And you'll also learn the value of each one of these native plants, how it works in its native habitat to benefit the wildlife. One of the most popular tours at the McGoffin home is given by the light of candles and kerosene lamps. For a society that can barely survive without electricity, the candlelight tour is a chance to see and feel how people lived a century ago. And I want to emphasize that we have more lights going tonight, more candles and kerosene lamps tonight than would have been typical at the time. For just a moment, maybe we can imagine what life was like for Joseph and Octavia McGoffin as they raised a family and made history in this adobe hacienda. The McGoffins are the descendants of Mexican and Irish immigrants who came here to make a better life. They made their mark on the Texas frontier by helping to turn this dusty border town into a bustling international city. Today, El Paso's McGoffin home is a Texas State Historic Site where the legacy of a true pioneer family lives on. I'm Suzanne Michaels. Thank you for watching.
Now that you've seen the home as it looked during the Josephine era, join us for a tour of the home as it looked in 1898 when Joseph McGoffin lived here. Our daughter, Joseph. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In 2005, several of the home's main rooms were restored to their 1890s appearance, complete with the family's original furniture. And that's what you will see here today. We will focus on the restoration of the home, including the specially made wallpaper and rugs that match the original Victorian style. This is the formal parlor of the McGoffin home. As you can see, it's quite elaborate. It has been renovated back to the late Victorian era of the 1890s. The home was built by Joseph and Octavia McGoffin, and it was pretty much as you see it today. After they passed away and their daughter Josephine Glasgow and her husband the general returned after his retirement, they decided to remodel the house. And when they did, they updated many things. They took wallpaper off the wall, exposed the beams, and pulled up the carpets. This is the home you saw up until 2005. So she updated the home, not only utilities, she added niches to the walls, she made some drastic changes, brought it up to the 1930s era, or the Josephine era. In this particular room, this is the formal parlor. It would have looked very similar to this at the time that the McGoffins lived in the home. The Victorian era is noted for fans, feathers, any type of knickknacks, and uh, this room represents a great deal of that particular period. Let's start with the carpet. The carpet is a Brussels carpet, and as you can see, many flowers. It is a floral print. The carpet is approximately 12 and a half inches from the baseboards. This made it much easier for servants to roll it up several times a year, take it out and clean it with a rug beater. Uh, the wallpaper is a floral print. Sometimes uh, the, there would be a border, such as there is here. The ceilings are canvas, and the canvas had a twofold purpose. One was to bring a serenity and a refinement to the room. The canvas was used as a, a softening and it was painted. It also had a more practical use. It was used to collect the dust and the dirt that sifted down from the adobe ceilings in this home. It had to be changed periodically because the weight of the dust and dirt would pull down the corners. So uh, this was done as needed. The draperies in this room are made of satin. Sometimes they were made of silk. The curtains would be Irish linen sometimes. The curtains and the, the valance are all hung on the same bar. The reason for this is that the walls are very thick in this home. They're anywhere from two to three feet thick. And the window casements open to the inside rather than the outside. The mirror in this room has hung in this room for many years, but if you'll notice, mirrors during the Victorian era were tilted outward. That was to reflect the focal point in the room. And in this case, you see both the piano and the table. The reason that we were able to renovate these rooms back to the 1890s era is because of photographs such as this one, which show us pretty much what this room would have looked like. We have pictures of other rooms in the home, which you will see, that do the same thing. They will show us a great deal of what we needed to know. One of the uh, focal points in the picture that sometimes is brought out is we have the puffer fish. The puffer fish has been in this room for over a hundred years. He looks pretty good for being over a hundred years old.
This is the Great Hall. This room has not changed much since the 1930s and was not part of the restoration. This is the informal parlor. This room was used more than the formal parlor because this is where the family would gather in the evenings and at other times just to relax after the day was finished. Uh, there was some work that did go on in here. Joseph's desk is in the corner. He did paperwork here that he brought home from his office. The children would look at pictures, play games, and sometimes read. The furniture in this room is typically Victorian. If you'll notice, there's wicker chairs and the proverbial rocker. This room is not carpeted for a very good reason. There was a great bit of traffic coming through this room into the bedrooms from the Great Hall. Also, people were in here a lot more than the other rooms in the home. The ceilings are canvas, but they are not painted. And uh, the whole house is adobe, which makes it very, very difficult to hang wallpaper or put up canvas. If you'll notice in this room, the walls are very, very irregular. Jim Yates, the professional paper hanger, said this was the most uneven room he's ever worked on. We were fortunate to have him here because he has papered rooms in the White House and many other historic homes. And what I do is I, whatever that is up there, it's probably not level. It's going to be two inches or one inch or you know, something. So I just drop a line, say 10 inches down and 10 inches down, which makes it parallel. And then I use a framing square off of that. Whatever that is off of that, it's not plumb, but I use that line on that wall. So every time I start a strip, it's not plumb. It's always crooked. So I hang every wall crooked. But what it gives me is that look right there. But that's what I do in historic houses. This room was the staging area for the major portion of the wallpapering that took place in this home. You know, wallpaper covers a large percentage of the visual part of a house, you know? So it's a real dramatic thing for wallpaper to go in. The way I feel about it is I, I like any historic house. I, I feel honored to be involved in this house as well as all the other houses I've been involved in. This is Joseph and Octavia's bedroom. They occupied this during the 1890s. And major differences in this room for renovation was this switching of the furniture from another room into this room. This piece of furniture was their bed in this room. It has not always been in this room. The carpet is also changed in this room. It's a floral print that is more like a tulip, but it is of truly Victorian print. If you notice, the wallpaper is the same. It's a sweetheart rose pattern with a border. The canvas ceiling in here has a print on it. The sink in the corner was quite a luxury. It was probably what we would consider the forerunner of the master bathroom. It certainly beat having to bring water in from outside. This room also got a lot of traffic because it does have so many entrances and people used it to cut from one area of the home to the other. This next bedroom is one you won't forget. Come into Josephine's bedroom. This room is truly Victorian, truly in every sense of the word. If you'll notice, the carpets are very, very floral, very brilliant blues. The wallpaper is floral. Again, the border and the canvas ceiling also has flowers. It is truly flowers, feathers, and fluff. As far as whatnots, if you'll notice the fireplace, the Japanese parasol, the picture of Josephine on the mantel, and of course the candlesticks, the peacock feathers, and calendars, anything sentimental was also considered Victorian. Notice the canopy bed. It is a half canopy bed. It's East Lake. It was given to Josephine by her father for her birthday as a young girl. 
There are several pieces to this set. And uh, she used this throughout her teen years. This piece over here, look at this, this dresser, is quite unusual for our time. It has German silver and porcelain casters. The most interesting part of this is the beveled mirror. This was quite a luxury for a young girl to have, or anyone at that period of time. You could stand in front of this mirror to check to see that your clothing was like you wanted, your dress fit like it was supposed to, your slip wasn't showing. If the seamstress came and you wanted to have a dress made, uh, a lot of times the hemming would be done as you stood on this platform. You can also see the heel marks in the platform where you would stand so the seamstress wouldn't have to stoop down so far. She could sit down and you could also see what the hem length would be. During the 1890s, when Josephine's husband was deployed to Cuba during the Spanish-American War, she came home to stay with her mom and dad with her little boy and she stayed here in this room with him. You can see the baby bassinet. This is something that was considered quite sanitary for the 1890 period. We know how this room looked originally because of photographs that we have. This, is a, this particular picture is a candid shot of Josephine bathing her baby in this room. Two of her children were born in this room. This was the guest room. Come on in. The people who stayed in this guest room sometimes stayed much longer than we consider guests to stay in our homes today. Joseph was a mover and a shaker. He was a man of vision, and because of that, he tried to get his friends to come to El Paso to invest in the development of the city. And in order to do this, he had to have a place for them to stay. So he invited them to stay here with him and Octavia. And uh, this room did not have a door at that time going into the bedroom. This was a private entrance. And so these people could have their privacy as well as the McGoffin family. Now that you've seen what the McGoffin home looked like in the 1890s, I would like to invite you to join us at some of our special events, which include monthly spirit tours. You can see the Ruffles tour dress as clear as everything. Spring and Christmas teas. And an October candlelight tour. Portions of the home can be rented for special functions. We also thank the state of Texas for underwriting the restoration and the Casa McGough and Compañeros, the friend group of the home, for additional funding and research support to make this restoration possible. This program is made possible in part by a grant from Humanities Texas, the state partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And funding for the production of this McGoffin Home Update was also provided in part by a grant from the El Paso County Historical Commission. Plan a visit to the McGoffin Home and see how the McGoffins lived in the 1890s. Thanks for joining us.